Hey, this is John. Uh, welcome to the question and answer videos. Um, I asked for questions and quite honestly, when I made the request, I, I, I kind of was hoping I'd get maybe three or four, <laughs> you know, um, to answer. And it's turned out I've got enough questions. Uh, there have been enough questions come in that I'm going to split this into two videos. So this is the first part. And I tried to get several people ask multifaceted questions. I tried to get in everything I could. Um, a few questions that some people asked were also asked by others. So I, I you know, I'm, if, if one person only asked one question and another one, it was part of their third, three or four questions, which was fine. Um, I, I tried to, you know, okay, I'll, I'll say this person's name and then this person will get another question. So I tried to keep it equal. Um, but it's, it's going to end up being two videos, two very long videos, um, which I'm, I'm okay with. Uh, and, you know, I, I appreciate everybody who participated uh, in this. So uh, I, I thank you very much for the questions and for anticipating uh, you know, that you'll get something hopefully useful uh, from it. Okay, this has to be the number one question I get asked anytime, anywhere, in any, uh, in any form, online, in person, whatever. Um, this is number one, besides, are you an idiot? Rich Brassel, and I hope I pronounced that right, asked, what is the average amount of time you get to work on models during the week? Um, average amount of time each week is a little more than 40 hours a week. Uh, and that's, <laughs> that's keeping in mind that I actually have a full-time day job. I'm a, a, by trade, I'm a web developer. Um, so I leave the house every morning, get to work, uh, before 8 o'clock at the office I work at. I work there, take my lunch break, um, and uh, work until 5 o'clock and come home. During the week for my model work around that day job, um, I get up at 4 o'clock every morning, seven days a week, and work. Weekdays I work on my models until 6 o'clock in the morning, and then I have to start getting ready for my day job. While I'm at my day job, unless there's something else going on, uh, I tend to use my lunch breaks to do pre-assembly work, uh, uh, nipping and denubbing kits, um, whatever, writing, whatever I can there during my lunch breaks. I get home, we have dinner, my wife and I generally go take a walk, um, and then from about 7 o'clock until 8.30, 9 o'clock, I work on models some more. Um, Saturdays, I get in 12 to 15 hours. Uh, in addition to, you know, we clean the house on Saturday, we do the yard work on Saturday. Uh, Sundays, I get in, um, like this morning, it's early Sunday morning. Um, I get in some work before six o'clock from, for an hour or two after that, I finish up preparations on, uh, a Sunday school lesson I teach at my church. Um, so I do that. And then when we get back from church, I spend the afternoon up until dinner working on models after dinner and a walk back to the models. Um, so it all adds up to uh, 40 hours or more um, a week. So it's, it's a lot of hours. But to get to where I want to be, which is a full-time modeler. That's what I would eventually like to do. I feel like I have to put in that time now to get there. Okay, as sort of a follow-on to that, uh, Paul Lombardi asked, uh, well, he said, and then he tacked on a question at the end. He said, your output is insane. Because um, I do generally have one model every eight to 10 days. Um, he said, your output is insane. How are you still married? Um, I, I, I credit the Lord and my wife. Um, she is a very patient woman. But 
the key is she absolutely supports what I'm doing. I mean, what I do is not just, for us, it's, it's not just a hobby. It is part of our family's income. Um, it is a supplement, a very necessary supplement to my work during the day. Um, it's not something that, hey, I, I want a lot of money, um, you know, so I'm going to do this too. It's if this doesn't get done, then I have to go do something else um, as a part-time job in the evenings. So she, she supports it, one, because our family needs it, but she also supports it because, she, I don't know how to say it, she loves me. She really does. And she wants me to succeed. She wants me to enjoy this. Um, just as in her hobbies and in her endeavors, I support her and, and love her and all of that. So I, I have to really, um, I can't say enough about my wife and the woman she is uh, in her support of this hobby that I do. Chris Bernick uh, sent in a question that asked, well, what do I think of pre-shading on Gundam, uh, Gunpla model kits. Um, and I, I, I guess I'll extend my answer to pre-shading on any kit. Now, let me start off saying I, I do pre-shading from time to time. Um, I have nothing against pre-shading at all. So please don't hear, don't email me and go, well, I pre-shade. I, please, pre-shade. Um, I have nothing against it. The reason I don't pre-shade very often is I'm not really good at it. Um, but I, I think there's a, I tend to do post shading. And I, I developed, not developed, but I started doing that when I was working on aircraft for so many years. And the reason I don't is, if you think about when you pre-shade, you put down a dark layer of paint and then you spend the rest of the process trying not to cover up parts of it. Now, if you're just pre-shading and putting one color over it, that's not too difficult. But when you start adding multiple colors over it, or if you want to introduce some distress or vari tonal variation to the main color, um, sometimes that pre-shading can get lost. I've always felt that post-shading is much more flexible. So I, I prefer post-shading and what I call post-fading because there's, it's, there's, there's two parts to that process. There's making recesses and panel lines in those areas, you know, the traditional way of pre-shading and post-shading is to make those darker. But there's also those wide open flat areas or areas that you want to highlight that you can highlight or fade the paint so, I, you know, if, if you do pre-shading and you like it, please continue doing pre-shading. Um, but if you're looking for a little more flexibility, try post-shading, um, which is something I probably ought to cover in a video. So that's a really good question. Brian Latour asked if I ever play any tabletop games, Warhammer, Age of Sigmar, things like that, because um, I build. Uh, quite a few Warhammer kits, and no, I don't. I don't actually play any of the games. Um, one is just for the very practical reason I don't have time. Um, Saturday would be my most likely day to be able to play. That's also the day that I depend on to get the most model work done for publication in following weeks. So I, I don't have. I really don't have the option to play, but to be honest, and, and I, <laughs> nothing against the tabletop gaming, but I, I just don't feel any draw to play right now. I've, I've watched in, in the evenings after I, I, I finish my modeling time, I give myself about an hour to kind of wind down. Um, I usually watch YouTube videos related to the hobby, and I've watched a few battle reports and watched the games being played. Um, and, and I do find it interesting. I mean, it, it, it's done in much the way that when I was a kid and me and my friends would set up little model soldiers. We used to, 
It was a very simplified rule system, but we would say, okay, this guy shoots at this guy, would roll some dice, and, you know, oops, he's dead. Um, so it, it, it actually draws me back in, in terms of nostalgia to what I did as a kid. But I don't feel, I guess I feel more of a pull to build than I do to play. I do feel some pull to do that. I think it would be kind of cool, but it, it's kind of like, you know, looking at looking at a, a cheeseburger and a double bacon cheeseburger. You know, they're both really good, and I'd like to eat both of them. But man, that double bacon cheeseburger, um, it's going to get my attention every time over the cheeseburger. So, yeah, maybe in the future. Um, if this ever becomes a full-time gig and I have more flexibility with my time, I probably will end up doing some kind of play with uh, some kind of tabletop game. Nikki Blowman asked, what are the most useful and useless hobby tools that I've bought? Um, and I think trying to, to give an exhaustive list of either one would be a little difficult in this format. But... I'm going to, in terms of the most useful ones, um, certainly I would think my my electric stir tool, you know, the little electric thing you stick in your paints and stir around, that's proved to be far more useful than I thought it would be. I mean, yeah, I just use it to stir paint, um, but it's really done a great job of preserving my paint. I, when I, I don't have to shake up paint anymore. It doesn't get paint under the lid, which causes the lid not to seal, which means paint dries out. It's really helped preserve um, uh, my paints. Uh, I, I think another one, and, and this is not necessarily a modeling tool, but I can't, t I made it a modeling tool. I can't tell you the number of times I use toothpicks. Um, I, I, if I don't have those around, I literally have hundreds of them on my work desk, on my airbrush station. I have them everywhere. I use toothpicks all the time for so many applications. Um, and, and, and I would have never thought that, that I would do that. Um, another thing that I find really useful is I've got a little coffee warmer. Uh, you can set your mug on and it keeps your coffee warm, but that's what I keep my brush cleaning water on and it stays warm and warm water, uh, coffee drinking warm, <laughs> um, has proven to be really great for cleaning brushes, for doing all sorts of things. So that's one that I've found really useful. In terms of, um, in terms of things that aren't useful, there are, there have been a few things that I bought that I didn't end up continuing to use. It's, I can't think of anything off the top of my head that's been useless. But, um, like for example, I got one of these Citadel um, um, seam tools, the, the, the little tool, you, the seam scraper. Um, and I started using it and I really liked it. Uh, but I have been using my X-Acto knife to do the exact exact, 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 anyway, um, to do the same thing for years. And I worked on a project, cleaned up the seams with the seam tool. The Citadel seam tool really liked it, set it aside, get a couple of days, weeks on, and I'm on another project where I need to clean up the seams. And I instinctively went to the X-Acto knife and I started using it. And I went about four projects before I remembered, oh yeah, I've got that seam tool. Um, and when I think of it, I pull it out. But I've found that for the way I work, it's it's not as useful to me as I originally thought it would be because it, while I think it does a better job than an X-Acto knife, I'm using an X-Acto knife in the cleanup process for so many other things, for, for shaving down nubs and for doing so many things. It's just easier to just flip that around. So that's one of them that, that I just tend to find that I don't use a lot, even though my initial impressions of it uh, were pretty good. And I'm, I'm sure if I sat here and went through my bench um, and all the drawers. Another one that I, I, I got, I got a dental P3 
pick, you know, those picks they use to pick your teeth. I got one of those and thought this is going to be perfect um, for doing scribing and things like that because it's it just it just looked like it would work really well. I used it a couple of times. I tried sharpening it. I tossed it. Um, it it didn't work any better than what I already had. Um, so it just it was just kind of a waste of money. Um, but I, I I tend to be more conservative now in what I try simply because I've built a lot of models and I've spent a lot of years doing that and I, I don't say this like I know everything but I found things that work and so I really have to be sold on trying new tools so a lot of the things I buy now are only useful um, because I've really tried to do my homework before I pick them up. Robert T. Wilson asked, what is your Holy Grail kit? Um, it's hard to say because in terms of aircraft, I went through a period where I, I went on this nostalgia trip and I, you know, I've got to get this kit or I've got to get that kit that I, that I built as a kid. And I got a few of them and I built them and they, building a 50 year old kit is, while it, in theory it sounds exciting, um, for my purposes, I, I want to get it done, I want to sell it, I, I don't want to spend months on it. Um, it I, I tended to no longer see them as holy grail kits. Now, the kits that I really wanted for nostalgia's sake, I didn't want to build. Like I'm looking over at my shelf there and I've got a, you know, Ravel Baba Black Sheep Corsair and I've got Lindbergh's old P-47 and Aurora's Freedom Fighter. I wanted all those. I found them online. I got them at a very good price because I'm cheap and I'm broke. Um, so in terms of aircraft, I, I already have pretty much the Holy Grail kits that I want. With my shift to sci-fi, um, Early on, I wanted to build a Citadel Valkyrie, um, which I've done, so that was one of them. I saw a Bandai Power GM, which I wanted to build, so um, a kind person has, has given me one of those, and I built that. Um, I wanted to build a Citadel Imperial Knight, uh, and I've actually built one, and I'm working on another. Uh, so, I, I don't know that right now I have a holy grail kind of kit, something that I'm thinking, oh, I would love to build one of those one day. I tend to be very shiny object. I can, you know, go and look through any online catalog or, or shop and I can go, oh, I want to build that. Oh, I want to build that. Oh, I want to build that. And then I come to the decision, okay, do you want to spend the money on it? And it's usually, no, I don't want to spend the money on it. So I guess the Holy Grail kit would be still out there. It still hasn't been produced. Like one that I would, I would spend more money on than I would normally ever think was sane is if Bandai ever comes out with a perfect grade or mega size GM kit. That's my favorite mobile suit design. If they come out with something really big like that, uh, you know, hey, here's Bandai's new perfect grade GM kit and it's $300. I'm starting to save my money up. That's one I'll build. Um, but I can't say that right now the, the, the Holy Grail kit for me, I don't know that it doesn't exist, but I don't know that I've found it. So I'm still looking for the knight in the castle, you know, and to not choose poorly. Chris Williams of Gross Models fame uh, asked, how much wood can a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? And I'd have to say seven and a half pounds on a weekday. Weekends, probably about half that output. Um, but it depends on the woodchuck. You know, you've got your lazy woodchucks, you've got your productive woodchucks. So that's probably a good average though. Richard Paul Snowball asked, which model would you consider your best work and which one was the, the worst experience? Um, this is going to sound 
I don't want it to sound self-praising because I don't mean it that way, but I'm not, I'm not really sure which one is my best work because I'm never completely happy with what I do. Some I'm more happy than others. Um, like there was a 124th scale brutish dog that I did sometime maybe late 2018, early this year. I'm not real clear. Uh, I don't remember exactly when that I was pretty happy with. I thought it was a notch up for me in terms of weathering and some other things. Um, it wasn't until somebody who I really trust their opinion. I, I, sh I showed them a picture. I just, I mean, I didn't preface it with anything. I just pulled it up on my phone when I finished it. And I went to him and I said, hey, take a look at that. And he looked at it and he goes, wow, that's really good. And I said, thanks. And he goes, oh, that's your work. And I laughed and I'm like, yeah, why? And he goes, he goes, no, you, I've always liked your work. He said, but that's a different league for you. Um, so I felt like that kit was a step forward, so to speak. Um, I, I hope it wasn't lightning in a bottle. Uh, there have been others that I think have gotten that way, but that one really stands out in my mind. Um, as far as kits that I just... There, there have been a few that have been stinkers, that the kits, for whatever reason, just really almost did me in. Um, but I'd have to say Special Hobbies IL-10, which was a later variant of the IL-2, uh, that kit actually caused me to take a sabbatical, I guess you'd say, from the hobby for about three months. I mean, several years ago I built it. it I won't go into all the details, but it was awful. Um, it's why I won't build, I've built a lot of special hobby kits. You know, people defend special hobby and say, well, you have to build, you know, special hobby kits to understand. I've built a bunch of special hobby kits. I, 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 I will not say this about most manufacturers, but I will say unequivocally, and I've seen the new ones, and I've actually built some of the new ones since then, I will not build special hobby anymore, period. Um, that company that produces them, I'm sure they're all nice people. I'm sure they're well-intentioned. I'm sure their models are going to get better. It's not worth my time or money anymore. That IL-10, <laughs> if you're detecting it, I hated that kit, I, I, it, but because it was a commission build, I had to finish it. I, I, I was so, I was so disgusted with that kit that I almost asked the person who commissioned me to build it if I could send them the kit, send them a new kit back, refund their money, plus some more, simply so I could take it out on my back porch. And I'm, I'm not joking, take it on my back porch, stomp on it until I started feeling better, and then burn it. That's how my wife, she looked at me and she goes, are you an idiot? You're going to make money on this thing. Just finish it. Um, so I did. And it, it, I felt bad because it wasn't, because I disliked the kit so much, it was hard to work on it, to do the level of work that I like to do. So yeah, that IL-10, if you hear me joking about special hobby, um, you know, that, that kit is why. <laughs> Okay, the next question is kind of a cool one that I've actually been looking forward to answering. Um, it's from, and, and if I mispronounce your name, Ben, I am sorry, Ben Kuramochi, and I hope that's right. If not, let me know so I'll get it right next time. But Ben asked the question, and I'm going to look over at my screen to read it because I want to get it right. He said, how do you choose which trees to focus on when trying to work on the forest and not focus on each tree? Um, which I thought was a really cool question. Um, basically, because I sell my work and photograph my work, the, the thing in my mind that I'm always looking at is, will this be seen in a photo and will the buyer care? Now, I know that sounds a little mercenary, but I think it helps me define because I'm trying to build for speed also. It helps me define what matters and what doesn't. Because it is, 
I see so many modelers get caught up by uh, what an acquaintance of mine calls analysis by paralysis, or paralysis by analysis, the other way around. Um, they, they look at something and they, they'll think, how can I get this just right? And they want to, you know, if you want to spend time on something, then, you know, absolutely go ahead. I'm, I'm not saying don't do stuff, but like there was, there was recently a Jedi starfighter that I was working on that there were parts of the cockpit that when I, when I test fitted everything together, I saw that all it really needed was just some contrast. Um, you, even if you shine a light in it, um, there's, if, if you, if you know where to look, there's actually not a lot of detail that I put into it. I just put in contrast. I wasn't even worried about it being that neat. I mean, I didn't try and make it sloppy, but I didn't try and go overboard with blends and with, with just really making it look photographic, you know, presentable because I knew once I glued that canopy on and once everything was in place, whoever's photographing it, you wouldn't see it. And whoever the buyer is, even if they shine the light in, they're going to go, oh, that looks cool. So, so that tends to be my, the point at which I, I, I make a decision, does this really matter? Now, having said that, there's sometimes that I will put in a little bit of time to something that may not matter in the long run, I get down into, not just into the trees in the forest, but I get down into the weeds around the tree simply because I find it fun. Like there may be a part of the interior that has a lot of detail that's going to be completely covered up. And I, I don't do it because, well, I know it's there. You know, I know it's there. It's craftsmanship. I don't consider myself much of a craftsman. I'm just a buffoon who builds models. But if I find it fun, if there's lots of little greeblies and I want to just paint them and shade them and do all sorts of things and see what I can come up with, I'll do it just for the fun. But for the most part, I'm a little mercenary about it, I guess. And I just look at it from how is this going to contribute to the end look and can anybody see it? And if the answer is no, I tend to unfocus on that tree and step back and begin looking at the forest again. Okay, John Vanover asked a question about, he, he said he had some crew figures that need white coveralls, overalls, and uh, he was asking, uh, basically, how would I highlight those, dry brush them, you know, how do you work with white? Um, I think, one, I think the trick to working with white is to not actually work with white, um, and I need to explain that. In other words, I, I rarely use pure white except for the highest highlights when I'm working on white. It, let's say you've got a figure, 35th scale, 48th scale, whatever. Um, I, I like to build from dark to light generally. I would start with a darker gray, um, maybe as a, as, a, as a base coat. And I don't mean like a really way towards the this, the black side of the spectrum of color. Something like a neutral gray, maybe just a little darker than that. Something between neutral gray and German gray. Um, I would start with that. And then, because you mentioned dry brushing, um, I would then step up to a little bit lighter gray and do a fairly heavy dry brush, trying to avoid the recesses, but not overly so and then just gradually build up to a very light gray. And then once it was built up and near white, I would then use, um, again, maybe with dry brushing, I would probably switch to a brush for this, but on the very highest highlights, hit it with something just less than pure white, uh, a, a cold gray kind of color, because if you just if you start off too light, you have nowhere to go visually in terms of the, the color. Um, by building that up, 
especially if you want it to look kind of dingy. Because if you, if you look at white, if somebody's wearing something that's white and baggy and they're not in bright light, it's really going to look more gray. So I think doing it more as gray um, will help. And then throw in some near white highlights and then maybe in a few areas some pure white highlights to really make them jump out. Um, so I hope that I hope that helps with uh, with getting those painted. Okay, Ed Chalmers asked, um, and this is kind of condensing it, but w was there one kit that you felt like really you could see a, a, a drastic jump, you know, in 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 how it looked, or was it more of a gradual process? Um, and the best I can say on that is I'll have to give a politician's answer, which is yes. <laughs> um, I, I'd, I'd mentioned, and, and because I don't know how I'm going to edit this, I don't know if this, in the, in the sequence of the videos, if in the sequence of the video, if this will be something I've already answered or which is coming, so forgive me. But there was this 124 scale brutish dog that I did that I felt really was kind of a watershed in terms of I had been here and then I kind of went here in terms of weathering. There have been a few models like that where I learned uh, specific new techniques that really helped out. Early on it was easy to see, okay, I, I painted something olive drab on top and gray on bottom and it looked good and somebody said, why don't you try panel lining? And so I panel lined it and all of a sudden that was kind of a fairly big notch up and then somebody said why don't you try fading and shading so early on there were some big steps now it tends to be more of a gradual process because a lot of what I do I don't I don't talk about it a lot but a lot of what I do are experiments in progress um, there are kits that I've built that I deliberately knew would not look as good as something else I had done because I was trying something new. Um, and anytime you do something for the first time, it's not gonna look quite as, as good as it look the 10th or the 20th or the 30th time you do it. So I, I tend to know, because I've, I've, I've built at this point around 300, I lose track, 325, 330 models. Um, and I know it's a gradual process, really. I mean, yeah, there's some big jumps every now and then, but I think the longer you do it, there's those jumps are less big, and you you tend to suddenly get to a point where you realize, well, something that used to be difficult is now not so difficult, and you do it without thinking, and you're not quite sure when that happened. Um, and, and so I, I tend to just, say, okay, keep going, keep going, keep trying something. The things that I find hard, sometimes I push myself to do them more. Sometimes, I, I, there, there's times when I try techniques that I go, you know what, for the benefit, this is too hard. If there are other ways, I'm a big fan of, of if, if I can get 80% of the look in 20% of the time, I'm going to do that rather than saying, Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna really go all out and get this if it's gonna take a lot of time because for my purposes time is is something I don't have a lot of. So it, it I guess overall it's more of a gradual process, but with occasional steps that I can look back. If I if I go through the list of I keep a spreadsheet of everything I've ever built um, for tax purposes and. Uh, if I go back and look at that, I can go, yeah, this, this was definitely a point that I could, like I've built 80 something Spitfires and I can go back and look at photos and go, yeah, this Spitfire number 12 looks very different than Spitfire number 24 versus number 48 and so forth. But very rarely, that brutish dog was a, a bit of a, a pleasant surprise. It was one of those that I got done and I'm like, how did I do that? Um, so it, it tends to be more of a gradual process. Okay, Adam Derrickson asks, how many cups of sugar does it take to get to the moon? It only takes one cup. 
if you use the proper fuel. Otherwise, it's, it's, it probably takes 12, 13, maybe even 14 cups of sugar to get to the moon. So, hope that helps you out in your quest. Jeff Gunbay asked a question that, that I, I get with some frequency. Um, it's kind of a series of questions, but they usually all kind of are lumped together for, for most folks. He asked, you know, how do you store your models? Uh, what, what do you do with them? Is it, is it hard to part with them? Um, one, I, I don't store my models. I don't display my models because I sell everything I build. Um, if, if I don't sell something it, for our family, that's, that's lost income. Um, so I have to sell everything, but I don't mind it because before I start, and I've been selling models since 2011, I've sold, I, I think I'm getting close to 250 models that I've sold. Um, I, I, before I started selling my models, when they were just stacking up on shelves, um, I never looked at them. They, they literally collected dust. The models at the top of my shelves, um, and I guess this may be a, you know, something my wife would rather I not say on YouTubes, but the ones on the top of the shelves just got, I mean, they would just get layers of dust on them because they would sit there for years. I, I never looked at my models once I was finished because for me, it's about the journey. When I finally get to the destination, I, I look at it, I go, hey, that looks cool. And, you know, I'll fly it around the room or I'll, you know, if it's a gun or something, I'll move him around and play with him a little bit and make some shooting sounds. And then they tend to go on the shelf um, and I would never look at them. So, I, I, because I sell everything now, I, people come over and they're like, oh, let me see all these models you got. And they come in and they see some old stuff I did back in 2006, 2007 that I don't feel is good enough to sell. And they look at it and they go, well, that looks awful. I'm like, well, yeah, you know, that's when I first started. And I, I'm, when we move from this house eventually, I'm probably just gonna throw them away. Um, maybe I'll keep a couple. Uh, there are a few times that when I finish a model that I think, man, I wish I didn't have to sell this one. And I generally give those a little higher price. I, there've been a few that I've said, okay, if I'm going to part with it, it I'm, I'm, there's going to be a bigger payoff. Um, I don't tend to ask a lot for my models, mainly because people won't pay a lot for my models, but, um, I'll ask a little more that I, I've mentioned it several times in this video, the, that brutish dog that I did. I, I kind of liked that one sitting around for a little while. Um, cause I would go back and look at it and go, how in the heck did I do that? Um, but for the most part, once they're done, they go on a shelf. I've actually found a couple sitting on shelves that I finished. And because I had several kind of backed up for selling, I would, it would go six or eight weeks and I would go, oh yeah, I forgot to sell that one. And I'd put it on eBay and sell it. So I finish them, they're kind of out of sight, out of mind at that point. Okay, kind of an interesting question from Lee Fogle. Um, and, and it touches on something I've already answered, but his is a, in a little different direction, so I wanted to, to hit on it. Because um, I think it's an interesting question. Again, I'm going to look over at my computer screen to read it. But he says, do you think that nostalgia hurts or helps the hobby? And in this day and age of amazing moldings, can we even wax nostalgic for stuff that's 25 to 30 years old? Um, and, and I can only answer this for me, and maybe it can generally apply, but this is my answer for me. I've found in terms of building that nostalgia hurts. As I answered in a previous question, I collect old kids that I have memories of from childhood, but I've come to the conclusion that building them is not quite as cool as I tend to think it will be. Um, to quote my boss, it, it sells better than it installs um, because the moldings now are just so good. Uh, you know, people ask me, they'll, they'll say, you know, they'll mention some old kit and they'll go, Hey, I got this kit real cheap. Do you think it's going to be fun? You know, what do you think of it? And I'm like, you know, if you have fun with it, great. But you probably would have been happier spending a little more money on a more modern tooling of a kit, um, rather than 
letting nostalgia take over and getting that 40-year-old kit, 50-year-old kit, which many years ago seemed really good, but today not quite so much in terms of building. Now, if you just if you just want to get that, you know, that monogram P40 from 1965, 66, whenever it came out, and you want to build that because you remember that as from when you were a kid, hey, go and build it. Um, but f for me, I I've found that I'm much happier if, if I think of an old kit that I enjoyed. Let's, let's go with that P40. I really liked that P40 kit as a kid. I really did. But I've built it when I first got back into modeling and I realized this was a fun kit as a kid. Um, but for the way I like to build now, I'm going to pick the newer Airfix kit because I, I realize now my 10 year old self would have liked the newer kit better than the older kit. And that, I guess, I guess that's the criteria. Which one would my, if, if I'm thinking in terms of nostalgia, which one would my 10 year old self go, oh, I'm going to pick that one. And I know, I know every time my 10 year old self would pick the newer kit because when, when I, I built those P40s and those ME 109s and all those things, you remember the pilots just had the peg in the back and you'd stick them in the back firewall and there was no cockpit detail. When suddenly I got to like monograms F86 and it had all of that detail in the interior or the B17, I began craving that detail. And I remember back even then, if suddenly, if I saw a kit that before I might have built a monogram kit, because that's what I tended to build, if it didn't have the detail of those later monogram kits, I passed it by because I thought it's, it's, I like the detail. So I, I tend to just say, what would my 10 year old self want to do? And I stick with, with, you know, the newer kits. Brent Hartman asked uh, kind of a dual question about inks and paints that I recommend and also about custom mixes that I have. Um, and now he asked specifically about dry brushing um, for the recommendations, but I'm just going to kind of talk in general because I think any, any paint can be a dry brush paint. Um, so I, I tend to stick with Vallejo for acrylic paint and then for airbrush use, uh, Tamiya and uh, Mr. Color. I also use some Citadel along with the Vallejo for a few colors, for very specific Canon colors or some that I just like, uh, like Lead Belcher. I love Citadel's Lead Belcher. Um, I've not found anything that I feel like can replace that. Um, I haven't used inks a whole lot because I hadn't really encountered uh, the notion of using inks until I got into sci-fi and specifically figure painting. And it's something that I've just not done. Uh, so, I, and I plan to, uh, I was actually watching a video last night uh, going over the use of inks and where they're, where they're good and where they're not good and what you can use them for. But I would, I, I stick with those brands. I try a lot of brands, but very rarely does anything move me away from what I've been using. Um, people come along and they go, oh, you got to try this paint. It's the best paint ever. And if you do this, you... there's this one brand that somebody was telling me about and they were saying, hey, try this. But you, you have to do this specific ratio and you have to do this and you have to have an airbrush dedicated to using. And I'm like, no, uh, -uh. the way I work, it's not worth it because I, very rarely do you find anything that works so much better that you'll go, I'll go through that to do this. So I tend to just stick with the big names. Um, but I'm not. I'm not always just standing on it hard and fast. Recently, I've started using lacquers uh, specifically because Lincoln Wright just he uses them so much, and I respect his work so much. And I thought I'm going to try using. I used them years ago and didn't like them. I'm going to try them again. I've pretty much started airbrushing lacquers only and not to me a paint 
Um, not that I have anything against Tamiya, but I thought the lacquers, as much as I liked Tamiya, I thought lacquers were even better. Um, so that's been kind of an unusual thing for me to make that change. But for the most part, even though I'll try different things, I tend to stick with, with those basics because they just work. Um, and in terms of, to answer your question, in terms of custom mixes, I don't really have anything to show or any kind of secret mix, which other than one, which I'll talk about, because my mixes tend to be just for spot use. Uh, last night I was working on something and I wanted something to be dark gray, but I wanted it to have a little bit of a steely look. So I did one part uh, neutral gray and one part lead belcher and mixed it up and put it on and I got this steely gray. It was exactly what I wanted. And it was just enough for that one application. So in terms of mixes, I just, I just eyeball it on the spot and work with, with that. I prefer to go out of the bottle just for speed's sake. The one mix that I, I always want to have around, um, there's a modeler in Australia named Chris Walkup, and I, I hope I pronounced his name right. Um, years ago, I saw him recommend a post shade color that is two parts uh, to me in NATO black and one part whole red. And it produces this kind of brownish, reddish. It's a great color for exhaust stains, for post shading, for um, any kind of weathering, streaky, smoky, dirty look. Um, and I've not found a color that that quite equals it. So I call it, for my own internal use, I call it walk up brown. Um, but it's two parts NATO black, one part whole red. And uh, I, I literally mix it a bottle at a time and I keep that. So that's, if I have any mixes, that's the one. Okay, got a very interesting question from Amy. Uh, no additional name was given. So Amy, you know who you are. Um, and it, it, again, I'm going to look over my computer screen because my memory is horrible. I want to read it because um, I think it's a really good question. I'm absolutely new to painting and am at a loss about how to start. Would you happen to have some fairly straightforward advice on how to get started? Non-scary guidance pertaining to anything from priming to weathering to brushes to paint selection would be much appreciated. Um, and... The, 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 this is not an all-encompassing answer. It's, here's what you do to get started. Here's just some basic things. First of all, um, and you identified in another part of the question I didn't read that you don't do airbrushing. Um, so that helps narrow it down. First, I would say, always prime. Um, later on, you, might dis you can discover when you don't necessarily need to. Always prime. For primer, I would recommend Tamiya Rattle Can Primer, this, the spray cans. Um, get, their, get their gray or their white, it doesn't matter. Don't worry about the undercolor. Um, I would recommend the gray. Prime everything in that. You make quick passes. Um, you just spray, spray, spray. Always keep the thing moving, don't flood it. Practice a little bit use that. There's, there's other primers you can use. People will say, oh, you can save money if you do this. You can use that. You sit I always tell people, get Tamiya, because Tamiya is like buying IBM. Nobody ever got fired for, for buying Tamiya. Try the Tamiya primer. In terms of paint, because you identified brush painting, um, I would go with Vallejo. Not that there's not other brands, but you know, if you go with AK or Ammo, those tend to be thinner and more difficult to brush paint. Um, Get, get the Vallejo basic set. It's, I think it's like 16 paints. It's got your, you know, your red, yellow, blue, green, all the basics. It's a good range of paints. Um, get those. Don't spit, do not, please, do not go spend $15 on a Winsor & Newton brush. People will tell you, oh, you've got to get this brush or that brush. Don't get the 20 cent brushes. Um, you can make those work. I use them all the time. Go to, um, if you're here in the States, go to Hobby Lobby, pick up the brushes that are three or four bucks each, get the round brushes, maybe a size zero, a size two, and a size four. Um, 
if you find a pack of them and, and don't worry if they're not natural brushes get get the get the uh, the synthetic brushes that's fine um, work on getting good clean base paints first that's if you can lay down a good base anything over it's going to look good if you can't lay down a smooth base of paint weathering and shading and fading and all of those other things aren't necessarily going to look all that great so work on the basics then I would add in um, elements like using washes, um, Citadel washes, uh, known oil, things like that. Highlighting, um, dry brushing are very easy entry techniques to get into. Um, so, so look to those. The biggest, after, after Priming and getting some paint and thinning your paint. Work on thinning the paint. Um, start with as much water as paint when you're thinning and see where that goes and adjust. But two things, I, th I think, even beyond that. Be willing to experiment and accept failure because you will fail at first. But that's okay because that's how you learn. So experiment and be willing to accept failure and then get on YouTube. Um, there are loads of good videos uh, about all sorts of, of painting topics, all the way from the basics to, to very advanced techniques. Watch everything you can. Um, the the Warhammer TV they they put out a lot of short little two three four minute videos that just cover specific techniques. Those can be really useful, even if they're how to paint armor on an ultramarine. Um, the basic techniques they talk about are all very useful. Um, uh, check out uh, the YouTube channel uh, Miniac. Uh, the guy's name is Scott. Does great work. Check out Miniac. He has a lot of how to videos. Um, and there's, there's others, certainly, hundreds. Uh, Vince Venturella, um, check out his work. But watch those videos and don't let the amount of over information overwhelm you. Um, look at them as, okay, here's, here's a whole bunch of information. Pull out one thing, maybe each week. Okay, I've, I've got smooth base coats down. Now I'm going to try shading, um, uh, putting in some shadow, and pick a product, pick non oil um, from Citadel, and say, okay, I'm going to I'm going to practice doing that, and do that to your figure, um, and then the next week, okay, I'm going to try highlighting, and just do some basic highlighting, uh, and see it all as a work in progress. Uh, when I started painting figures, I went on to eBay and found some pre-assembled ultramarines that were already primed, and I got like 15 of them for 20 bucks. And those have been paint mules for me to experiment with. So that might be something to look into. Um, you, it's it's a good question. It's a big question, and you're gonna get you're gonna get a lot of different advice. People are gonna say, "Oh no no, you need to get this brush or that paint." Like I said. To me, a primer, Vallejo paint, synthetic brushes, that starts you off simple. But the biggest thing, and you can't get around this, because it's the same way with airbrushing, you have to practice. Paint and paint and paint and paint. And be willing to fail and be willing to get frustrated with it and be willing to throw a few models around the room and break a few paint brushes. I mean, you know, hopefully not. But, you know... Understand, you're not going to paint that first thing and go, yeah, that's perfect. Um, you might. Uh, I, was, I was listening to a podcast between um, uh, Miniac and, uh, oh, his name slips me now and I apologize because I really like his work. But he, he did, uh, his first figure won an award, but he spent like 100 hours on it. So... You know, if you have just one figure, put in the time, repaint, redo, work on it over and over and over and over again. 
and you'll see where you're solid, where you need to grow, and all of it will start making sense. So thanks for the question. It's a great question, and I hope that helps. Okay, Jim Deck sent in uh, a two-part question. First part is grill or barbecue? And I'd have to say it depends, because in my mind, grill is a verb, barbecue is a noun. So um, that's the best answer I can give you on that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, I've known Jim for years, so that's kind of a, 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 something we've joked about for years. Um, in a group of us who are insane about models and barbecue. Anyway, his second question, a little more modeling related, I'm going to look at it to read it. He says, how do you keep so disciplined? Thank you for that. Um, it's one thing to be disciplined in a task that has to be done, but it's an entirely different thing to be disciplined in something that's a recreational activity. Um, I've already hinted at this in my answer, not hinted at it, I've answered it kind of, but not directly. Um, for one, this is not a recreational activity for me in total. It is a second job. I like it. It's fun. It's my hobby. I'm glad I can use my hobby to earn some extra income for the family. But it's not a recreational activity. But having said that, even before I started selling my models, I was building 20 to 25 models per year. Um, and the best answer, to, I guess it's kind of a two-ish part answer. Um, one, I just love what I do. I love this hobby. Um, I have great fun at it. It relaxes me. It clears the day out of my mind. Um, it gives me something to focus on. It's a creative outlet for me. I've always been kind of bordering on the artsy type. I'm not really much of an artist and I'm not really great at it. But I've always felt a need for creative output. So this really satisfies it. And because I can tie it into writing, that really helps me. Um, but the other part of it, and this is, this is, I, I was in the army for many years. I was a, a paratrooper. Um, but I, I think that, that fine tuned it. But you mentioned how do you discipline yourself? That's it. You have to discipline yourself. Um, I get up, I mentioned already, seven days a week, 4 a.m. People say, how do you get up at 4 a.m.? When the alarm goes off, I sit up. I, I, don't, I don't hit the snooze. I don't groan about it. I don't have to set six alarms. When the alarm goes off, I sit up. I get up. I'm old, so I go to the bathroom first. TMI, I know. Um, but I, I come in here and I work. I, every time I sit down at this bench, I get something done. Um, I focus, I, I put aside other things. I don't watch, I used to watch loads of NFL and NASCAR, and I don't watch any of it anymore. I had to decide at some point, okay, if you really want to build a lot, and if you want to write about it, and if you want to have a good output, you have to put aside other things. So, I'm not saying you've got to put aside every waking moment to, to model if you don't want to. But my advice to people who say, oh, I never have time to model, I'm like, it's because you don't make time. You know, if, if you're normally getting up at 6 o'clock to go into your job um, and you're comfortable with that, get up at 5.30. Um, stay up a half an hour. A friend of mine, uh, he told me, he said, yeah, but I have kids. And in the evenings, in, you know, in the mornings, I'm getting them, helping my wife get them breakfast. And in the evenings, we're dealing with the kids. And I'm like, but if you want to model, you'll get up half hour or hour before the kids get up or you'll stay up a half hour you know and you don't want to take away time from things I know that that are important you 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 want to give those but I, I'm a big advocate of getting up earlier um, you know and a friend of mine said well I can't get up any earlier I said what time do you go to bed he said about one in the morning I said why do you stay up late he said I'm watching TV I said okay so you'd rather watch and we talked a little more I said so you'd rather watch TV from 10 to 1 at night but then have to get up at 7 o'clock in the morning. Why don't you go to bed at 10 o'clock, get up at 5 in the morning, and you have time for models. Or if you're a night person, do the modeling from 10 to 1 rather than the TV. When I quit watching loads of network television, I gained I, easily 15 hours a week, 20 hours a week of model time. So 
I, I guess the, the basic answer is to how do I discipline myself? I discipline myself. Um, it's just like when I was in the Army. I had to get up at you know, 4.30, drive in to work, get there, do some duties in the, the company headquarters uh, in my last job in the Army, then go out and do PT, then go eat some breakfast, take a shower, get right back to work, and just be at it all day. I mean, it's the same way you discipline yourself to go mow the yard or to go to work or to do anything. Um, if the hobby is something you want to do, you will discipline yourself to do it. When people tell me, yeah, but I just can't do that, and I don't say this in a judging way, I'm like, then, then you really don't want to do the hobby. Not you're stating it by your own intent or your own actions. So just, but the main thing, every time you sit down at your workbench, do something. Don't sit and look at references for days on end. Pick a color, pick a style, whatever, and just go with it. And that, that's how I make sure that something happens every time I sit down. Well, that wraps up part one of the question and answer videos. Uh, thank you to everyone who sent those in. If you didn't hear your question, uh, your name called in this video, look for part two to come out before too long, and you'll be in that one. Um, again, thank you for the questions. Thank you for participating. Uh, thank you for supporting the, the work that I do, whether it's just uh, through Facebook or Instagram, visiting the blog. Um, a special thanks to the folks who are my patrons. If, if, if you're not already a patron, I would greatly appreciate um, if you would consider supporting the work that I do uh, because it, it not only keeps me going uh, in terms of modeling, but it's, it's, it's a part-time job for me and it's, it's very appreciated by not only by me, but my family. So thank you for your support. Uh, so until the second part of the question and answer videos, happy day to you, friends. Bye-bye.